Before we get started, let's take a moment. Uh, we'll have a word of prayer, and I'll take any announcements. Uh, Philip and I want to get the announcements, if there are any, uh, before the uh, worship assembly. But let's, uh, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this beautiful day you've given us. Father, again, we're grateful for the, the changing of the seasons as um, the weather cools and as things change, we are reminded of, of your uh, power. We're reminded of uh, your wisdom. We're also mindful of uh, your consideration of man uh, to provide his needs, and we're just so thankful uh, that you have seen fit to, to bless us in so many ways, especially uh, in a physical way. We're mindful, especially this morning, of our spiritual blessings as we are assembled here in the name and by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, to uh, worship you and to offer up our praise and adoration to, to you, the only living and true God. Uh, there are a number of our folks that are not able to be with us by reason of infirmity, others uh, that are struggling with other matters of life. Father, some are traveling. Uh, we pray thy richest blessings and the hand, thy hand of providence upon them uh, in whatever need that they have, that they might be safely uh, returned and or healthily uh, uh, returned to us and to, to be numbered among us at this place. We pray always for the forgiveness of our sins, knowing that uh, we do and say things that, uh, that separate us from a proper uh, and undefiled relationship uh, with thee. And we, we pray for forgiveness for the things that we do that are contrary to thy will, and we pray for uh, forgiveness for the things that we leave undone, that the things that we know that we should do. And we are thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus and the shedding of his blood that makes that uh, forgiveness possible uh, through his blood. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, looking at the matter, again, the overall context of the book is the matter of idolatry. Uh, but he's going to focus here on the situation with Aaron and uh, the giving of the law in the middle part of the book of Exodus. And, uh, and, and using, uh, using that as a case study of sorts on how, again, how to deal with and or prevent spiritual anarchy. Now, anarchy just, is just a, a word that just means without restraint. Um, just to give you an example, just a, 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 like a, a real-life example. Uh, back during the fall of the Soviet Union, when the various nations that had been a part of that Soviet system, uh, nations like Poland and, and all that had been part of the Soviet Union, uh, when they gained their independence and they went back to what they were before World War II so far as their, their own sovereignty and whatnot, uh, there was a lot of difficulty because... There had, been, there had been this oppressive thumb of, of the Soviets upon the people for so long that when that thumb was removed, they thought there was no thumb at all. And people just went wild. They didn't stop at stop signs. They didn't stop at stop lights. I mean, they just, in other words, they just cast everything. All forms of restraint were cast off. And it created, obviously it created difficulties. Now, obviously these difficulties didn't last a long time because people could start seeing the difficulties created by their lack of restraint. Uh, but, uh, 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 but as we think about, as we think about Israel, as we think about Israel, and, and in this particular, this particular case, uh, they threw off all restraints. And the timing of this, I think, is critical as we, think of, as we think about the situation, the context, but it also serves to warn us uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, we can, that we can fall uh, prey to the same mindset. Um, let me just give you another quick example. Jeffrey and I talk at least once or twice a week about the Bible. He calls and he tells me what he's studying and what he's preparing for, to teach and, and whatnot. And, uh, and he, made, he made the statement about Israel. He said, how, he said, how could they just do what they did after seeing all the things that God had done for them? You know, that seems to be a valid question. And I said, but I said, I understand your point. I said, but let me ask you this. How can we do the same when we can look at all that God has done for us? 
I mean, is it is it any less a valid point to to when we look at our Bibles and we know that the Bible's been given to us by God and God has preserved it for us and we can know that it is His Word and without question and that we can put our faith and our confidence in it. Not to mention the fact that we've seen all the good that God has wrought in our own lives. That it's so you know before we get too hasty to point the finger at Israel, you know, for fickleness or or lack of dedication, you know. We better be careful because, because we are oftentimes guilty of the same things. And so as we look at this particular, at this particular uh, well, the, it's the golden calf incident, for lack of a better term. And it talks about God wants, um, God wants leaders uh, uh, and, and, and uh, people with wisdom uh, that can, again, that can head off these types of difficulties uh, before they happen. And in the first full paragraph there, it says that uh, uh, passi passivity, compromise, and timidity are not what Almighty God expects from those who sincerely seek Him. But even more than that, those are, those are characteristics that cannot be found even among those who lead His people today. You know, a, a timid shepherd is no shepherd at all. You know, Jesus said the hireling runs when he sees the wolf, but the shepherd does not. Why? Because they're his sheep. You know, in other words, he has, a, he has a vested interest in protecting the sheep, you know, whereas the hireling says, you know what, I can go find another job somewhere else. And so, so we see, you know, why, why shepherds are the way they were. And, you know, David killed a lion. David killed a bear. And he was just basically a boy, a young man. Uh, but because it, you know, but it's his family sheep. You know that was his livelihood. You know, it's, it's like I can either let that bear eat or I can eat. <laughs> I can let that lion eat or I can eat. Well, it makes makes it a lot easier to make that decision then, doesn't it? And so and so God wants God wants shepherds and preachers and and, and leaders uh, in the churches. And by the way, leadership does not have to come from the top. Let me just say that that uh, leadership can come from from any from any person in the church. Um, I can think about growing up, there, there were some really, really spiritually stout women in the church where I grew up in Missouri uh, that uh, their husbands weren't deacons, their husbands weren't elders, uh, but you know, if something, something was going awry, you would have to deal with them. Not that they were trying to usurp any kind of authority or anything like that, but they knew what the Bible said and, and they, like everybody else, expected the Bible to be taught and to be followed, and, you know, and, and not to, to be, uh, no deviations. And so you have here in letter A on page 86, the, the failure of Aaron's leadership. Um, one thing I think we forget, or maybe we don't know, is that when, when Moses went up into the mountain, okay, to receive the, the law that all, by the way, he also received all the things that pertain to the tabernacle. You know, he was gone for 40 days. And so, you know, he didn't just receive the Ten Commandments in that 40-day period. He received all the things that pertain to the tabernacle, uh, matters dealing with brethren, property, uh, sins, uh, 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 sexual sins, crimes. He, he received the, this, this whole body of law. But before he left, he specifically told Aaron... You're in charge. I'm going up to the mountain, and you are in charge. In other words, he didn't just leave and, and just and, and leave nobody you know, at, at the top. And he said, and if anybody has a problem, you handle it. I mean, that's what the text says. I mean, that's a paraphrase, but that's exactly what it says. I'm going up to the mountain. You're in charge. If there are any problems, you handle it. Don't, don't say, well, we'll wait till Moses gets back. You know, you handle, the, you handle these issues. And so it was clear to Aaron and to everybody else that Aaron was in charge when Moses was gone. And so let's think about this. God has just led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, where they'd been for 400 years. I mean, the, the plagues are still fresh in the minds of the people. Uh, 
the parting of the Red Sea still fresh in the minds of the people. Um, you know, God's leadership, the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. You know, all these things, all these things are still fresh in the minds of the people. The people in Exodus 19 and about verse 28 and also in Exodus 24. And by the way, Exodus 24 involves Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu in confirming God's covenant with the people. There was a sacrifice made. There was a sprinkling of blood. In other words, it, it, there was a big, for lack of a better term, there was a big public display about this is the covenant that we have made with God and we are going to keep it. So how do you get from there to the golden calf in 40 days. You know, it's not, it's not like Moses went on some great journey and he'd been gone a year or two or ten or whatever. He'd been gone 40 days. And the people knew where he went. They knew why he went. By the way, there were still signs surrounding the mountain in other words, there was, the, the mountain was covered with cloud and smoke and there was thunder and lightning. And the first time Moses went up on the mountain, you know, the people were told to, to keep their distance. And God had to send Moses back down there because they're like a bunch of rubberneckers on the highway. Onlookers, you know, they're trying to gawk at everything. And the more they gawk, the closer they keep getting to the mountain. And God sent Moses down, had to send him back down to Mount and said, y'all better stay away from here. Yeah, I told you to keep your distance. You better keep your distance or the Lord's going to break out against you and it ain't going to be good. So then he goes back up the mountain. And here we are. Well, that was after, that was after he came down the second time. And so, so how do you get from that point to... Well, we don't know what's happened to Moses. Build us and make us an idol. 40 days. And just shows you, it shows you how undiscerning, how unfaithful, how uncommitted that people can be uh, just by, by way of human nature. But they got, they got to that point in 40 days. Now, here's what happened. The people didn't make the God. The people came to Aaron and they said, hey, we don't know what's happened to Moses. Concerning Moses, hey, look, we don't know what's happened to him. Make us a God. Make us a God. Now, what should have happened right then? He should have shut that thing down right then. He should have rebuked them. He should have charged them to be reminded of the covenant that they'd made, you know, about you know, six weeks ago. But what did he do? He said, well, break off your earrings and, you know, and your jewelry and give it to me and we'll see what we can come up with. But see, that thing could have been stopped, as Barn, Barn would say, he could have nipped it in the bud right then, right? But he didn't. But why didn't he? See, the Bible doesn't tell us why he didn't nip it. In the bud. But look there under letter A, the very last line under that first, that first paragraph there in letter A. It says, Then Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? In other words, you know, were they breaking your fingers? You know, did they put you on the rack and start stretching you? You know, were, were they tormenting you? Were they torturing you? Did they threaten to kick you? What in the world have they done to cause you to do this? In other words, surely you didn't just do this on your own. It was inconceivable to Moses that Aaron could have done exactly what he did without, you know, threat of life and limb. Right? Surely you couldn't have just done this on your own. And yet he did. And in so doing, he cost a lot of people their lives. You know, the Lord, you know, the Lord broke out against those people over that thing. And, and the sons of Levi, you know, were, were given charge to, to punish the people because, uh, because of their sin. And the point there in letter A, I didn't mention it, but 
Uh, God, needs, God needs leaders who have courage and are not cowering. Courage and not cowering. You know, it, number one, there at bottom 86, Aaron was held responsible for the idolatry that erupted in Israel's camp. He was in charge. He had the authority. The people recognized Aaron's authority because they went to him to ask for the idol. He could have stopped it, but he did not. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul comes back from the slaughter of the Amalekites. He had been given express instructions before he left by Samuel, the man of God. You kill everybody. And you kill everything. Every animal, every person. You kill everything. So here comes Saul back from his victorious campaign against King Agag and the Amalekites. And the first words out of his mouth as he comes back on this victory march is, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel says, what do I hear? What is this bleeding of sheep that I'm hearing? You know, what is this lowing of the oxen that I'm hearing? You know, because I'm pretty sure you weren't supposed to bring back any of that. What's that what did Saul say? The people. The people. The people wanted to bring back the best so that we could sacrifice it to God. Of course, then Samuel gives that great, that great discourse, that great statement. You know, does God have as much delight in sacrifices as he does obedience? In other words, your sacrifices are worthless to God if you're not obeying him. It's just like for, for Christians today. Your worship doesn't mean a thing to God if you're not obeying God. If, if you're not doing your dead level best to serve God every single day, your worship in, on any given occasion is absolutely worthless to God. In fact, it makes God angry. You know, Proverbs 28, 9, Whoever turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. And so Saul, remind, or Saul is reminded, you're, you can't worship God when you're not obeying. He says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken better than the fat of rams. But that's right, the sacrifice didn't cost him anything. God gave it to him. That's like David said, I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. I believe it's about 2 Samuel 24, 24. And, and so, yeah, that sacrifice didn't cost him anything anyway. But, uh, but let's, just, let's just assume, and by the way, I believe that Saul was telling the truth, the people. I believe the people demanded it. But the question remains, who was the king? Who was the king? Saul was the king. Who, who should have squelched that thing the moment that it came out of the first person's mouth? Saul should have. By the way, as best I can tell, nobody else was punished. Nobody else was punished for that disobedience. Saul bore all of the punishment because Saul should have brought it to an end before it ever got started. By the way, Saul was never, ever a brave king. If you recall, when they appointed him the king and it was time for them to, to have the big coronation and the big party, he didn't even show up. He was hiding. So where's Saul at? He's in there hiding. King James says he's hiding amongst the stuff. <laughs> in other words, he, he, he's crawled up in a big pile of some stuff. He's high, he don't even want to come out. I mean, he, he was never, he was never to be considered a courageous leader of God's people, either morally, spiritually, or, or physically. 
And because of that, the people of God, the people of God and his own family suffered because of it. All right, top of page 87 with regard to courage in leadership. Number two, top of the page, conflict is unavoidable. Conflict will arise in the Lord's church. You know, any, anywhere you have a gathering of people, eventually there will be conflict. Whether it be, look, when two people get married and they start sharing the same household, there's going to be conflict. And then you start adding kids to the mix. So, in other words, we see from the you know we see from the very from the very moment that you get at least two people together in the same place for any length of time, there's going to be conflict. All right. So, how much then? How much more should that uh, be considered when we think about the fact that a local church is a collection of families into one family? that don't all have the same interests, that don't all have the same, uh, well, whatever, social status, level of education, uh, financial uh, means. Now, now you're going to bring in a, a conglomeration of people into one family. There's going to be, there's going to be conflict. I mean, it, again, it's unavoidable. By the way, Paul spoke specifically to this matter in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 18 and 19, he said, there's conflict in the church. By the way, he had already mentioned it earlier in you know, chapter 1, verse 10. There's divisions among you. And he's t he condemns that division. And, um, but you get, to, you get here to chapter 11 with regard to the matter of the Lord's Supper. And he says, and I, I find this very interesting. He says, it's necessary for conflict. It's necessary for conflict to arise. Think about this. The strength of a relationship, let's just say a marriage relationship. The strength of a marriage relationship can only be known by the amount of conflict that it endures and how that conflict is handled, right? You know, why, is it, why is it that so many people in our society today divorce after you know, maybe just a few months or a year or two? They've never learned how to deal with conflict. And so rather than learning how to deal with conflict, they just do what? They just leave. They just leave. Of course, God didn't give us that choice. You know, he taught us, you know, husbands how to treat their wives. He taught wives how to treat their husbands. And when those things, when those things happen, then you learn how to deal, you learn how to deal with, with conflict. So let me ask this. I'm going to ask this. Well, look at, look at number three because I need to introduce this. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. This is John Cackleman speaking, all right? This is not a quote from, from some other source. He says, At one congregation in West Tennessee, an elder told me, We want everyone to be happy. We don't want to lose anyone. The comment was made because there was a group in the congregation seeking to undermine the eldership and initiate changes that would improve, see there, in quotes, <laughs> improve the congregation. The eldership did not want such changes to occur, were opposed to such changes, but acted like Aaron and tried to avoid conflict. It did not work. A courageous response would have saved that congregation much turmoil. All right? This... This exact scenario took place in my home congregation in Missouri. 
where there was a group of people who were seeking to follow, at that time, what was known as the change movement, the change agent movement. You know, uh, you know basically, change agent movement is just what we would call liberalism. You know, we want to we want to consider denominationalism the equal of the church. You know, we're all on the same. You know, we're all on the same side. Uh, you know, you know, it, you know, we're really not that opposed. As a matter of fact, we'd probably like you to use the instrument. We'd like for you to expand the role of women. You know, just just all types, all types of what like what we would call liberalism. All right, the eldership, because some of these people were prominent members in the community. Let them run roughshod through the church. You know, let them teach Bible classes. And I, I might add this, in some of the largest classroom av space available in the church. So what happened? They let them conduct house meetings where they could gather people and recruit them over there. You know, another people they thought might be sympathetic to to, to what they wanted. And they let them have meetings outside of the church. So guess what ended up happening? In, in an attempt to keep the peace, in an attempt to not lose everyone, guess what ended up happening? They lost a significant portion of that congregation because they allowed the cancer that those people were spreading to go unaddressed, unchecked, and they thought, well, we'll just pacify them by letting them teach a class over here, and we won't we won't monitor the class. We'll just you know we'll just keep them appeased, and that way we can at least keep them in the pew. Well, none of those people are there now. None of them. That thing should have been stopped immediately. The, the, the moment it was clear that these people were not on the same page as the eldership and the rest of the church had been for the last hundred years, that thing should have been stopped. And if they weren't going to stop, they should have been withdrawn from. It's just that simple. In order to avoid the very thing that happened, they caused it to happen. They caused it to happen. If they had acted early on, they might have lost 15 or 20 people. As it is, they lost, you know, they just lost a slew of people. Not only that, it ended up destroying the reputation of the church. I mean, it, it harmed the church in the community. You know, there has to be courageous, bold, decisive leadership. You know, it happened here. Miss Bueller will remember it, I know for sure. Because B.A. was an elder at the time. But there was a preacher here who had begun to embrace the Boston movement, the Crossroads movement that had, had originated uh, in Florida, had been embraced by a, a number of prominent people around the country. And, uh, and B.A. and Grover were the elders at the time. And uh, Grover began to hear some things. And he talked, you know, he talked to B.A. about it. And they finally they called him in and said, is this, the, is this the direction that you're going to go? You because know, this is not the direction this church is going to go. So, you know, you, know, you, have, you have a choice. You can either get back to preaching what you preached when you first came here, or you can what? Hit the bridge. That's right. Hit the road, Jack. And they got rid of him. They got rid of him. What would have happened if they had just said, you know what? Uh... You know, a lot of people here like Alan, and, uh, and and we're afraid if we you know if we discipline Alan, that 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 they might leave. That but that wasn't the position that they took. The position was we got to protect this church. We got to protect this church, and in so doing, they did protect this church. As far as I know, not one person in this congregation went off into that after he tried to start teaching it. That's what bold, courageous leadership does for a local church. It spares the church a lot of heartache. By the way, I'm sure it wasn't, I mean, Mueller could probably tell you, I'm sure it wasn't easy for them to fire him. I'm sure it was a difficult decision. But it was a decision that had to be made in the best interest of the local church. Now, 
The question I want to get at here as we start drawing to a close is, we want everyone to be happy. All right? Hey, Lynn, you want everybody here to be happy? Okay. Philip? Yeah. John? You want everybody here to be happy? All right. Now, I'm going to make it unanimous. As much as we can. Yeah. All four elders have affirmed we want everybody here to be happy. All right. So now we ask the question, how, how, let me, now let me ask you this. Is it, now, now be careful before you start responding. Is it possible for everybody here to be happy? Is it possible for everybody here to be happy? See, some of you are shaking your heads no, and some of you want to say yes, but you're kind of afraid to say yes because you know how human nature works. I would say that it is possible. It is possible. T takes the eldership to bring them into unity. And, and by the eldership, you mean the eldership doing what God's Word says. Look, it's not possible for every person to be happy all the time. <clears throat> all the time. i right, give you an example. Do you think I've been happy every day here for the last 25 years? Do you think I've been happy every day here for the last 25 years? I mean, Lynn, you've been here as long as I, I mean, Lynn's been here longer than I have, but what I'm saying is Lynn and Hugh, Furman, Miss Beulah, you know, they've been here. In other words, they were here when I got here. All right. They would probably not hesitate to tell you that I've not been happy every single day in my 25 plus years here. So then why am I still here? Why am I still here? That's exactly right. Because I love people here. You know, I've been married 34 years. You think I've been happy every single day of my life? <laughs> Better question still. You think the woman back there in that room been happy 34 years? Every single day? Why are we still together? Why? Why are we still together? Love. Love. We love one another, and we love God, and we love God. So in the same way that a married couple can stay together, even though they're not happy, by the way, we've been mad at the same time, right? But the same way a married couple can stay together for 34 years is the same reason a preacher can stay somewhere 25 or however many years. Because there's three things, there are three things that have to be present, all right? Number one, people have to love God. People have to love God. Number two, people have to love truth. They have to love truth. And then number three, they have to love one another. So that when the time comes in the life of the local congregation that someone becomes unhappy, if everybody involved loves God, loves truth, and loves one another, can that problem be solved? Absolutely it can be solved. It can be solved. So that's how, that's how everybody in the congregation can be happy. When we all love God, when we all love truth, and when we all love one another. Yep. I don't remember that. That's before my time. That's before my time. But what it wasn't right. It, it that you know in that situation it wasn't it wasn't right. Let me get. I gotta tell you this. Um, 
you know, when preachers get together, you know, we talk about how things are going, local work and whatnot, and uh, and there's, and I'm not going to say who, but uh, there's one preacher I talk to and quite a bit, and and invariably once or twice a year, he says, uh, he says something to the effect of, uh, I got a couple here at where I preach that uh, that I'd like to work out a trade with you. I like to work out a trade with you. Now he he's only semi kidding. But what is he what is he saying when he says that? They're trouble. I wish I didn't have to deal with them. You know, I you know, and if you take them off my hands, you know, you know, I, I you know, I'll just trade them for considerations down the road. <laughs> Right. You still have to do it, you know. But and I, I but I was thinking about that that, that, that those conversations. Like I said, in there's a lot of joking involved in that. And I thought I thought to myself this morning, there ain't nobody here I'd trade. There's some great Christians, you know, out in Marion County and some great Christians in the area that I'd love, that I'd love, you know, if they didn't have a home church, you know, the kind of people you'd like to have, but I wouldn't trade for them. You know why? Because I think by and large, everybody here is pretty happy. Again, not every day, not all day, every day. But I, but I think, listen, I think there's something real special about this church family. I really do. You know, I go a lot of places. I see a lot. You know, I see a lot of congregations. I talk to a lot of preachers in other states, and 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 look, most most of them don't have what I've got. Yeah. Yeah. Not only what I got, but yeah, what what the potential is. Yeah. The old faith, what they used to be. I've now been there a long time. Yeah. But when you walk in there, that place is amazing. Yeah. Just the amount of people, everybody wants to shake your hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, double, in my mind, double springs. Now, is, is, that, is that, is that, I mean, not to pick on them, you know, but you think, is that church without any problems? I'm sure they have No. Yeah, they're not without problems, but what do you have? You have a bunch of people who love God, love truth, love one another. I think about where Andy is up in Salem. Love God, love truth, love one another. Think about where Bill is at Crandall. Love God, love truth, love one another. I mean, I, you know, like I, say, I do know some people who have some really good works. Don't get me wrong. But that number is far fewer than, than the guys that I know that struggle. That struggle. And so, uh, but, uh, you know, conflict is, conflict is unavoidable. Have we had a bell yet? Had one? All right, I'll tell you what. Let's start, let's start next week in letter B on 87. I'll try to make a little more headway. But this, this, this particular lesson really struck me, the opening of it. because Number one, because of having the work of an elder and also having a congregation that, working with a congregation that I believe is really exceptional, you know, with regard to, you know, how it, functions and and how its members uh, interact by and large you know f for the most part so th I wanted to focus on those things uh, particularly first of all so that Lynn and Philip and John and I affirm that we're all on the same page and that that we want what's best for this church but also to let you know that we you know all four of us believe this is a special group and I, and I think that's just borne itself out over the last particularly the last two decades and so I wanted, I wanted to really encourage, encourage the church uh, in that respect. All right, so next week we'll pick up on page, pick up on page 87.